Goodwill and the Ambulance. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on BostonFreeRadio.com, watching on Some River Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I've got five new movies to review for you for this show, including, let's not beat around the bush, Ant-Man and the Wasp. But first, let's get to my first segment, which is... What's topping the box office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, a few are flops, but I will let you know exactly what the difference is. Beginning with the number one movie at the box office, which is what probably everyone expected, Ant-Man and the Wasp, which opened to $75.8 million here in the States and $161.7 million worldwide, and that is against a budget of $162 million. Now, it does pale in comparison to Black Panther, which opened worldwide at $202 million, and Avengers Infinity War. By the way, both of those movies, like Ant-Man and the Wasp, are also in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But Avengers Infinity War opened to $257 million worldwide. That's in its first weekend. But Ant-Man and the Wasp has two very tough acts to follow. And I will also get to that uh, review in a little bit. But the good news is that while Ant-Man and the Wasp is not a hit yet here in the States, it's on its way to becoming one and should be one by next week or the week after. But internationally, it's just very, very close to being a tentative hit. I think it'll be certified very soon. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, for a movie that's not as good, I think, as the other two Jurassic Park movies I've seen, is still doing pretty well for itself. It lost the number one spot and is now number two, having grossed $28.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from $170 to $187 million, somewhere in that range, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has so far grossed $333.4 million here in the States, and $106 billion worldwide. I didn't actually expect this movie to hit the billion-dollar mark, but it did, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit worldwide. So very good for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. The Incredibles 2 is one of those movies that, that's actually doing better than Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom here in the States, but around the world it's not doing quite, quite as well for some reason. But... This weekend it made $28.4 million at the box office, just a fraction less than Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. But against a budget of $200 million, The Incredibles 2 has so far made in the States $503.8 million, and around the world it has so far made $772.3 million as well. So The Incredibles, needless to say, is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. The First Purge is another movie that debuted this week, in addition to Ant-Man and the Wasp. It wasn't expected to do nearly as well as the latter movie, but it's still doing pretty well for itself, especially given its budget. So The First Purge actually opened on July 4th, not on July 6th, which gave it an advantage. And it, on a, against a budget of $13 million, The First Purge is so far grossed $31.3 million here in the States and $43.1 million worldwide, making it automatically a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And just this weekend, the first purge made $17.4 million. And I can't exactly do the math, but it made about half of its money Wednesday and Thursday of this week. It probably made some really big numbers on the 4th of July itself. But still, it's a certified hit, so very good for that movie. Sicario, Day of the Soldado, is number five at the box office, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $7.6 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $35 to $45 million, somewhere in that range, Sicario, you know the rest, has so far grossed $35.6 million here in the States and $51.5 million worldwide, which means it may or may not be a hit here in the States, but around the world, it is most certainly a tentative hit so far. 
Uncle Drew is another movie that debuted last week, and this week it dropped from number four to number six, having grossed $6.6 million at the U.S. box office. But against a budget ranging from $17 to $19 million, Uncle Drew has so far grossed $29.9 million here in the States and $30.5 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. I definitely didn't expect this movie to break box office records internationally, especially since most countries outside of the U.S. and Canada probably haven't even heard of Kyrie Irving, the star of the movie, but what can you do? Ocean's 8 is number 6 at the box office this weekend, having dropped from number 5 last week, and it made $5.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $70 million, that's $70 million, Ocean's 8 has so far grossed $126.5 million here in the States, and $237.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit, very close to a certified hit here in the States, and around the world it is most certainly a certified hit. Tag is number eight at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week. It made $3.0 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $28 million, though, Tag has so far made $48.3 million here in the States and $60.5 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit worldwide, which kind of disappoints me because Tag was a much better movie than I thought it would be, and I thought it would actually be elevated by word of mouth, but sometimes that doesn't happen. But in any event, Won't You Be My Neighbor is number nine at the box office, but it's actually the only film on the list to actually climb from a lesser point of the list. Last week it was number 10, this week it's number 9, having grossed $2.6 million and making a total in, uh, national gross of $12.4 million. I don't know how much this movie cost to make or how much it made internationally, but I would assume it's doing well given its budget, but then again, it's only speculation on my part. And finally, number 10 of the box office is Deadpool 2, sliding from number 7 last week, having made $1.7 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. It's a certified hit because against a budget of $110 million, it has made so far $314.5 million here in the States and $727.4 million worldwide. And I thought I was going to run completely out of time after I said that fact, but I didn't. But either way, even though you won't see Deadpool 2 in the top 10 last week, it's Hi, I'm Danica hit. Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the black experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is the 20th movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And sadly, it's actually going to be the last Marvel Cinematic Universe movie released this year. I feel kind of spoiled saying that, you know, saying that, it's, it's the last one from the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we're going to see this year. I don't know if I was actually expecting to see one this Christmas, but rest assured, next year there will be at least two Marvel Cinematic Universe movies that are being made. There's going to be another Avengers movie, and there's going to be a brand new superhero by the name of Captain Marvel. So that's it's, it's going to be a, a good ride, but it's going to, be, it's going to seem like a really long wait, even for somebody like me who sees three to five movies a week. But anyway, <coughs> excuse me, Ant-Man and the Wasp takes place about two years after the events of Captain America Civil War, because that was the last movie in which we saw Ant-Man, who is reprised 
in this movie for the third time by Paul Rudd. And in this movie, we learn that actually the the scientist who created the Ant-Man costume, or I shouldn't say costume, Ant-Man suit, Hank Pym, had a wife by the name of Janet Van Dyne, who in this movie is played by Michelle Pfeiffer. And it turns out that she has, she's not dead, but she shrunk herself to minuscule proportions, which you might remember Ant-Man did in the first movie, only unlike Janet Van Dyne, she has not come back from that minuscule dimension, if you will. It's not exactly a dimension, but it's, it's a place that is so small that probably a period at the end of a sentence would probably seem like the size of the, the planet Earth, so to speak. But in any event, the, the plot of Ant-Man and the Wasp revolves around Ant-Man, again played by Paul Rudd, and Hope Pym, who's played in this movie and actually in the last movie by the actress Evangeline Lilly, are out to find the, the, the scientist Janet Von Dyne, who is Hope Pym's mother, and restore her back to her original size. But that is not particularly easy, especially when there are a couple of villains after them. One of them is a supervillain whose name is Ghost, or whose, whose avatar is Ghost. It turns out she is a British woman by the name of Ava, who is played in this movie by a beautiful young British woman by the name of Han Hannah John Kamen, who you might not know by name, but you definitely know her face, especially if you've seen her in a movie that is surprisingly still underrated, um, this year's Ready Player One, which was directed by Steven Spielberg. I thought that was an incredible movie. It's still one of my favorite movies of the year, but surprisingly, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, which probably means that a lot of people haven't seen it yet. But it is coming out on DVD later this month, so maybe that will change. But either way, I did think Hannah John Kamen made a really good villain, not to mention that she was intimidating, but also, given her striking beauty, she certainly uh, turned a lot of heads for other reasons. But there's also an illegal arms dealer in this movie named T Sonny Birch, who's played by Walton Goggins. And Walton Goggins, you might remember, again, not a particularly familiar name, but a very familiar face. You probably remember him as Sheriff Chris Mannix from The Hateful Eight, but he's also been in a number of other movies and TV shows. Some of the TV shows in which he's starred in in recent years have included The Shield and Justified, amongst other TV shows. But he makes a, a character that's, that's similar to the one that Sam Rockwell played in the second Iron Man movie. And even though he's not as imposing a villain as the Ghost, played by Hannah John Kamen, he certainly uh, is a, a good adversary uh, to Ant-Man and the Wasp. And, yeah, it sounds from the title of the movie that Ant-Man would be fighting the Wasp, but nope, they're on the same side and they have the same mission. So very much like the first movie, I, I think probably the first movie... I, I had very low expectations for because I didn't really know uh, Ant-Man. I'm not a huge comic book reader, so Ant-Man was a character I've heard of, but very similar to the Hanna-Barbera character, Adam Ant, I'm thinking, okay, so he can shrink himself to the size of an ant, so what? But the first movie certainly exceeded my expectations. The second movie I definitely expected to be fun, but considering it's coming out the same year as Black Panther and Avengers Infinity War, I also knew that Ant-Man and the Wasp had a very, two very tough acts to follow. But I think that this movie certainly had an advantage in that in being the underdog, especially amongst these two other mammoth Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, it certainly had fun with its premise. I really loved Paul Rudd in this film. He, he made me laugh a, a lot, especially in the very beginning of the movie where he is actually on house arrest because of the stunt he pulled in the um, Captain America Civil War. The, the Civil War that went on between the members of the Avengers in th that movie uh, w happened in Germany, and apparently 
Paul Rudd's character, Scott Lang, was actually not supposed to be in Germany because of the conditions of his probation, because he's an ex-convict. So I thought some uh, the, the movie was, was set on the, the right note in the beginning where, you're, where you see Paul Rudd um, sort of passing the time away without his ex-wife and his daughter in the picture. And he's supposed to be in the house, and he has an ankle bracelet and everything. And I thought the way he passed the time away before... Evangeline Lilly's character came in and set him straight on the, the mission he's he's supposed to have. I, I thought that was a good note to have, but in addition to that, Ant-Man and the Wasp was a very, very fun movie to watch. So, And th- there's also the question of where was Ant-Man during the events of Avengers Infinity War? Well, there are some ties to that movie that you wouldn't expect from or you wouldn't entirely expect from getting into the story as much as you have but ant-man and the wasp i can't quite compare it to black panther or avengers infinity war but all i can say that it's energetic it's fun and it's good i had a great time watching it it gets my rating of a knockout and certainly sets the pace for the upcoming marvel cinematic universe movies that are coming to theaters near you in 2019 i personally can't wait tweens have mastered the art of tuning out Jen, there's a spider in the car. We're turning your room into a home gym. See? Nothing. But some messages need to get through. Like making sure they're buckled up. The whole ride, every time. Do whatever it takes to make your child listen. Jen, I friended your boyfriend. Wait, what? Buckle up, sweetie. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The, fir- the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The First Purge, which is a prequel to the previous Purge movies. And I couldn't give you a detailed description about the other three Purge movies that have come out over the last, I think, probably seven or eight years. But I actually have not seen the last three Purge movies. So this is the very first Purge movie I saw. Usually I have a rule with sequels in that in order to see them and review them for you on this show, I have to have seen the previous movies, but I made an exception with The First Purge for a couple of reasons. First of all, I know basically what The Purge is, and secondly, it's a prequel, not a sequel. So I figured I'd I'd watch this movie and review it for you here. And I did see this movie on opening day on the 4th of July, I'm I'm at that age right now where I don't really do very much for the 4th of July. The the fireworks have kind of worn off for me and the the Esplanade in in Boston is way too crowded. And so for being 35, I just kind of chill out on the 4th of July. I usually go to the movies and this today was certainly no exception. So, the first purge takes place in the not too distant future or sort of an alternative dystopian future where after the rise of a third political party known as the new founding fathers of america which for some reason sounds like a very frightening name for a political party kind of like the tea party it just it it makes you frightened but anyway so after the rise of this rogue political party that has crushed the democrats and the republicans in the previous election an experiment is conducted where there are no laws for 12 hours on Staten Island. No one must stay during the experiment, yet there is $5,000 for anyone who does. So what I wanted to see from the first purge is, I, I guess for me, the, the specific reasoning behind the purge. And you do get to know certain people who are behind the execution of the purge, including Chief of Staff Arlo Sabian, who's played by an actor by the name of Patch Dara, and the architect, Dr. Updale, who's played by Marissa Tomei. Now, I actually would have thought that if they, if the plot had focused on the two of them and their constituents who are orchestrating this this purge experimentally, I think that alone would have been 
an interesting film. And certainly when you see the purge from the eyes of the other residents of Staten Island, you would think that there would be an interesting movie. There certainly are interesting characters. There is a, a gang leader by the name of Dimitri, who's played by Yolande Noel, as well as a former girlfriend of his who's now a civil rights activist, whose, whose character's name is Nia, and she's played by a fine young actress by the name of Lex Scott Davis. And I thought there was an interesting dynamic where you have Nia protesting against the Purge. And, of course, as the Purge is going on, she is in hiding. But, unfortunately, things get complicated when her brother Isaiah, who's played by Joy Von Wade, gets into the Purge and is also taking the researchers up on their offer to get $5,000 from participating in the purge. So I thought you had some interesting characters and a very interesting concept, but unfortunately, two-thirds of the way into the movie, it's just the, the same kind of purge stuff that I would imagine would have happened in the previous film. So again, the first third of this movie was off to a good start. This, the second third of the movie showed the purge actually starting and some of these people preparing. But then the third part of the movie showed just people killing each other. And when you see that again and again and again and again, it's not particularly interesting. And I have to confess that I actually fell asleep during the first third of the movie because I really didn't care. But again, there is a certain plot twist involving the architect, again playing played by Marissa Tomei, and also the dynamic between her and Patch Dara's character as they're orchestrating the purge and, you know, keeping tabs of everyone who's participating in the purge behind the scenes, showing who kills whom and also basically what they're doing. And I again I thought that if they just focused on that, just focus focusing on scientists and researchers in this lab, almost having a third-person view of the terror that's going on in the streets as this purge is going on, I thought that would have been a compelling movie and almost sort of an alternative to the found footage films. And if they had stuck with that, if the movie had really trusted its storytelling instincts rather than compromising those for high-octane killing again and again and again, I think it would have been interesting. But unfortunately, the people who wrote this movie, who, if you're inter actually, there's only one person who wrote the movie, James DeMonaco, and let me just actually look up if James DeMonaco has done other films. He's actually known for the previous Purge films. Yeah, he's written all of them. He's He's written the first, second, and third Purge, but my guess is that there was some studio interference here. Either that or James DeMonaco didn't trust his own um, storytelling instincts because there could have been also another alternative way to tell the story of the first Purge. For instance, why was Staten Island targeted? And wouldn't there be some controversy not only within Staten Island but also the rest of the world where... The purge is being orchestrated in a in a city full of black and Latino people. Why that city? And wouldn't there be a controversy regarding you know black and Latino pe people just killing themselves for profit? Wouldn't that raise a civil rights issue? Those would have been smart ways to tell the story. But unfortunately, the first purge sacrifices storytelling for sensationalism and suffers as a result and it gets my rating of a strikeout again there are several good actors in this movie i was impressed by patch de Ra, marissa tomei lex scott davis yelan noel jovian wade but unfortunately when it's killing after killing after killing after killing the novelty wears off really quick and this movie definitely lost its traction by the third act, which is really too bad because I think that to get an origin movie, it, it had a really good opportunity. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. 
Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Leave No Trace. This is the latest from director and writer Deborah Granick. And Deborah Granick might not sound like a particularly familiar name, but first of all, she's actually born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, interestingly enough. And she's best known for the movie Winter's Bone, which is actually the breakthrough performance of Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence was actually nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress in a Leading Role for that movie. And Winter's Bone, even though it didn't get, even though it wasn't a particularly big box office hit, it was nominated for three other Academy Awards, including Best Picture, uh, Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role, John Hawks, and also Deborah Granick herself was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. But unlike Winter's Bone, Leave No Trace is actually, I believe, an original story. Let me just uh, confirm that. But while I'm confirming that, I'll just tell you that the stars of this movie are Ben Foster, who is an underrated actor, and a relative newcomer by the name of Thomason McKenzie. And the two of them do really well uh, in this movie, and I'll explain about that. But actually, I was mistaken. Leave No Trace is actually based on a novel called My Abandonment, which was written by Peter Rock. The screenplay for Leave No Trace was written by Ms. Granick and also Anna Rossellini. So the, the movie is about a father and his 13-year-old daughter who are living a seemingly ideal existence in a vast urban park just right outside of Portland, Oregon. But a small mistake gets the attention of social workers who tell them they can't, that they can't live in this park because it is public property. And they're living all, an existence kind of similar to shows like Survivor or Naked and Afraid. But, of course, the main difference between the way they're living in this movie, Leave No Trace, and Naked and Afraid is that they are living with clothes on. But the difference is that they're, they're surviving day to day in sort of an outward bound kind of way. They make their own fires, they provide their own shelter with tents, and they basically live off the fat of this public land. And the reason for that is hinted at. You'd, you'd have to extrapolate it, but there's enough information to extrapolate here that Ben Foster is a war veteran, probably of the Iraq and or Afghanistan war. But in any event, there's there are enough clues here that lead you to conclude that he is struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, of course, his 13-year-old daughter is along with him on the ride, but doesn't complain about the way the two of them live in this park. But then when their mistake attracts the attention of forest rangers and also social workers as a result, they are brought to live in a farmland somewhere else in Oregon. But there are enough trappings of the modern life that they become disillusioned with the new way that they're living, even though these social workers insist that the 13-year-old daughter, who's played by Thomas and McKenzie and is known as Tom in this movie, I guess they used her actual first name, that she needs to go to school and live a more well-adjusted life. In fact, there's a great scene in this movie. It's very subtle, and Ben Foster does an amazing job in this film, but there's just one scene where th the two of them move into this, this farmhouse, and Will is settling into his bedroom, and he sees a TV on the dresser. And the way he just takes the TV and puts it in the closet, it's a very subtle move, but it also... It, garnered a lot of laughs from 
the audience who was watching this film with me, and I even laughed too. And it's actually, in a way, refreshing to see characters like these who are appreciative of nature and don't desire to live, you know, in the big city with the bright lights and are also not blinded by the wonders of nature through TV. It's great to see characters like that. And in a, in a similar way, the, the movie Winter's Bone and probably the novel on which it's based had a similar theme. There are people of limited means who are yeah, struggling day to day, but also not unappreciative of the struggle. They certainly are people who find their own way. And I thought that this is an amazing either debut or breakthrough performance by Thomasin McKenzie, who is actually not an American actress. She's a British actress. But she has been in a, a number of other... TV shows and movies up to this point, but none of which I'm familiar. She's probably been acting in Australian and New Zealand um, productions. Yeah, none of the other films that, that I know of have, have come out ar around my neck of the woods, but I think if, if enough people see this movie, Thomas and McKenzie could be the next best thing in terms of New Zealand or Australian actresses who actually make it in the states this is certainly a very impressive debut by her and ben foster is one of those actors who i'm he's getting enough he's actually a local boston actor if you can believe it he was uh, he's just a 36 year old actor who's been in a number of films of note including hell or high water from two years ago and also other films like the remake of 310 to yuma as well as The Messenger and Alpha Dog, amongst others. And I noticed him for the first time in 1999 when he starred in the Barry Levinson film Liberty Heights. That's an underrated and also very beautiful movie. And I think this is probably Ben Foster's best role to date, uh, amongst his several other strong roles. And I love the dynamic between him and Thomas and McKenzie. I believe that they were father and daughter and I was very surprised when I found out that Thomas and McKenzie is actually a New Zealand actress so Leave No Trace is a movie that might get overlooked because it's not getting the nationwide release of movies like Ant-Man and the Wasp or Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom but it's certainly one of those subtle movies you should check out and it gets my rating of a knockout it's a movie that came out at first in Great Britain and later on in the States but I really loved the story and also the acting jobs by Ben Foster and Thomas and McKenzie. It's certainly movies that I hope propel them to bigger and better acting jobs in the future. And certainly I enjoyed this movie immensely. And that's all I have to say. Hoy es el día en que tu hijo empieza a gatear. O leer sus primeras palabras. La casa roja. O cuando se dio cuenta que quiere ser ingeniero. Dos X más Z. O es hoy. Cuando tienes un choque en tu auto, tu hijo está en el car seat equivocado y todo podría cambiar. No arriesgues el futuro de tus hijos. Asegúrate de tener el car seat correcto para su edad y tamaño. Visita safercar.gov diagonal protegidos. Un mensaje de la Administración Nacional de Seguridad del Tráfico en las Carreteras y el Ad Council. BFR BostonFreeRadio.com This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Whitney, which is a documentary about, well, probably the most famous person named Whitney of our modern times, Whitney Houston. And it is an in-depth look at the life and death, but also the music of the, that singer. It's directed by Kevin McDonald, who is a Scottish director who I wouldn't have expected to direct a documentary about Whitney Houston, but he, he's probably best known not only for a number of documentaries, which he's made over the last couple of decades, but he's known for directing such uh, gripping dramas as The Last King of Scotland, which earned Forrest Whitaker his first and so far only Academy Award for acting. And he's also directed other movies like Touching the Void and State of Play. So it's a little difficult to review documentaries like this because the synopsis of the film I've pretty much already gave you an in-depth look at the life and music of Whitney Houston. So I guess I could delve into a little bit of <laughs> my growing up hearing Whitney Houston's music. And I'm a little ashamed to say this because in high school and, and in college, I was a metalhead. I was into music like Metallica, Megadeth, Pantera, you name it. But I do have to admit, as every single pore in my body is opening right now and I'm sweating profusely, yes, there are some songs by Whitney Houston that eh, I guess you could say defined my childhood and adolescence. Not, not only the fact that my mom got her 1987 album, Whitney, which is probably her best album overall, so I grew up listening to songs like So Emotional and I Want to Dance with Somebody Who Loves Me. But also, I have to admit, in junior high, I remember thinking that one particular girl on whom I had a crush, I remember thinking, if she went home, put Whitney Houston's first album into her CD player and played the song How Will I Know full blast and thought of me, I would be the happiest guy on earth. But then when it didn't turn out that way and I kind of found that out the hard way, I put a certain Whitney Houston album into my CD player and played the song Why Does It Hurt So Bad. Yep, okay. <laughs> I'll admit that that's my history of Whitney Houston's music and my appreciation for it. Uh, it. I mean, I would say that Whitney Houston is a bit of a guilty pleasure because of her broad appeal, but also there are worse artists to have guilty pleasures um, from listening to their music. So if that's the guiltiest I, I can have in my guilty pleasure... <laughs> repertoire then i guess i'm doing okay but back to the documentary at hand this documentary actually does a really good job detailing the life and unfortunately the death of whitney houston who died a couple of years ago i think it was six years ago now at the comparatively young age at 40 of 48 and the way she died and also her tumultuous last 10 years makes the story really tragic. As a matter of fact, if you were to have told me when Wendy Houston was at the height of her of of her career and her life, you know, if you were to have asked me if she would have a continuing life and career along the same lines of singers like Aretha Franklin or Roberta Flack or if she would have a tragic death the same way that Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, or Jim Morrison ended up, I would have chosen the former over the latter. And it's because of her ending up a little bit more like the latter, especially dying in a bathtub, the same way Jim Morrison did, that makes her story all the more heartbreaking. And I will admit that watching this film, especially towards the end, I knew how it was going to end, but I actually found myself shedding a few tears, especially considering that her daughter, Bobby Christina Brown, died the same way. And I think what makes the story even more tragic, especially given the people who were alive to be interviewed for this documentary, especially her mother, Sissy Houston, who was not as successful a singer as her daughter, but still did very well in the music industry, and also her two brothers that were alive, and the, the, the at least the family support she had. Y you think to yourself, 
I wish there was some way I could have helped a woman like this, but at the same time, if her support network couldn't help her this way, then it, it almost, it, it sort of felt like she was doomed in one sense, but I don't want to say doomed because that's, there's a negative connotation to that. But at the same time, th- this movie details very well not only her her childhood and her her rise to fame, while also making very limited use of her music. There are only a few clips of certain s- songs of hers, and a lot of those are live recordings because, of course, using that kind those kinds of uh, music clips cost a lot of money. And a director like Kevin McDonald is not as prolific a filmmaker, or at least not as well-reputed a filmmaker as somebody like Steven Spielberg, who could probably get clips like these a little bit more easily. Or maybe even an African-American director like Lee Daniels or Spike Lee probably would have had um, more sway in the film industry to get these kind of clips. But either way, even with very limited use of Whitney Houston's music, you get an immediate sense of what kind of power she had as a singer and what made her special and also elevated her amongst other singers who were popular around her time, like Paul Abdul or Janet Jackson, who, by the way, in very limited, unseen, behind-the-scenes footage, Whitney Houston actually cast some shade on these singers. But also, there's some great behind-the-scenes concert footage of Whitney Houston also showing a side to her that you wouldn't normally see. And unfortunately, a side you didn't see in that ill-advised reality show she did with her husband Bobby Brown, being Bobby Brown, which was uh, a terrible black mark and something she should not have done. But Whitney is still a fantastic documentary. It certainly is sad, even when you know how it's going to end, and it gets my rating of a knockout. Again, it shows that this this singer had a gift, and she used it as much as she good, could, but she also fell victim to circumstances that befell other people who were less fortunate than she was. Open sad. road, here comes the Hefley family. You've packed the smartphones, headphones, tablets, water snacks, coolers, sunscreen, bikes, skateboards, games, videos, sunglasses. There's no room for people in here. Just don't wimp out on the most important thing. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on, on a stick. stick. No, seat belts. Whether it's a long haul or short trip. It's a win-win situation. Never give up until they buckle up. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Three Identical Strangers, which is a documentary. And it is a pretty amazing story, especially given that this story happened in 1980 before social media, cell phones, well, especially smartphones, and even when a lot of people didn't have computers. So this tells the story of three triplets who were born identical, and it is a a film that starts out kind of like The Parent Trap, where you have one guy by the name of Robert Shaffron who is on his way to community college, and when he arrives at this community college, he finds that so many people are greeting him in a friendly way. And I'm not just talking about the fact that they're waving and smiling, but also a couple of girls actually come up to him and kiss him and saying, I'm so glad you came back. So if you know the premise of the movie, you kind of know that, (laughs) you you kind of know where this is going, but it's still pretty amazing because apparently Robert Shaffron, who's, who's known as Bobby, is getting settled into his dorm room, but then he is visited by 
somebody he doesn't know who just can't stop looking at him. And it turns out that Bobby looks like another guy this other, <laughs> this other classmate knows by the name of Eddie. So it just so happens that this college acquaintance has Eddie's phone number. So they go to a phone booth immediately and they call Eddie. And then eventually Bobby talks to Eddie and they both find that they were born on July 12, 1961 and both of them happen to be adopted. So this acquaintance drives Bobby to Eddie's house. It's amazing uh, in Long Island. And it turns out that Bobby Shaffron meets Eddie Galland for the first time, and they find out that they were long-lost twins. But even more amazing than that is that when their story makes the paper, and it's already uh, an incredible story that's getting, that's getting nationwide attention, they all of a sudden find that they get a phone call from a guy by the name of David Kelman, who looks a lot like them and happens to be born on the same day, July 12th, 1961. So they reunite for the first time since literally having shared a crib together. So eventually the story is so incredible that Bobby, Eddie, and David become celebrities in their own right. They're interviewed on on daytime talk shows. They're interviewed on news shows like by the likes of Tom Brokaw and Jane Pauley. And they're also brought on to talk shows, including one by, by Donahue, Phil Donahue. But after the celebration happens and, you know, the, the, the party's over, this movie, or rather the, the families of these three adopted siblings, begin to ask one question. Why was it that the three of them that were separated? Why, why weren't they presented as triplets as they are? And what, what you learn is that the families actually did confront the adoption agency that, that put these three boys up for adoption. And according to them, according to the adoption agency, they were separated because the likelihood of somebody adopting triplets was less so than just adopting one child. But one of the parents actually angrily says, if I had known that this, this boy had two other brothers who were, well, not only tr triplets but also related, I would have taken all three of them. And it's, it's very understandable to, to know w what these parents are going through. But at the same time, the movie unravels even more um, ironic and almost disturbing circumstances when you find out that not only these three triplets, but other sets of twins were intentionally separated by this adoption agency for the purpose of psychological longitudinal studies the results of which have not been published to this day. Now, I'm not giving anything away when I say this. There are some shocking twists and turns, not only of these identical triplets, but also of other identical and fraternal twins who are part of this study. And remember, this was back in the early 60s. This was around the time of other controversial psychologists like Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbardo, who were conducting dubiously ethical experiences uh, or experiments uh, or let me rephrase that experiments of dubious ethics but that was before the American Psychological Association developed a code of ethics or a code of conduct for such experiments but it is actually pretty fascinating and I and being a psych major myself I know very well the effects of such psychological studies, not only the effects, but also the purpose of studying such psychological studies. And I get what the purpose was, but at the same time, this, the, the movie alludes to the damaging effects that this psych, psychological study had. And also the fact that not only were the results not published, 
and are actually sealed until some year way down the line, even further than 2016, even though it's 65 years later. But it's, it's just incredible what this, what this movie reveals. And very much like other great documentaries, this movie deals with a lot of intricate detail. But it's astonishing both the psychological study and also the fact that these triplets are connect so easily. And the, I, I loved hearing the stories about how the three of them became celebrities and went into New York City and partied at Studio 54 and even got the attention of such unknowns at the time like Madonna. And I'm not going to reveal everything that happens to them, but it is an incredible true story. And this happened before social media and before cell phones and computers. And it's amazing that it did. So three identical strangers. I'm running out of time. It gets my rating of a knockout. It's an incredible true story and an incredible documentary. Definitely see it. If you Driving can. means. Freedom. Exploration. Fun. Pride. Flexibility. Travel. Protection. Ability. Friendship. Excitement. Escape. Independence. Distracted driving means. Danger. Recklessness. Irresponsible. Chaos. Police. Devastation. Injury. Tears. Death. Safe driving means staying alert and staying alive. Visit stoptextstoprex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tune that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for you this show, it's now time for my final segment of the show, which is What's Coming Up Next. These are the top, or the, the movies that are coming to a theater near you, unless I say, I say otherwise. And if they're not coming to a theater near you, you can probably check them out maybe in limited release at your local art house cinema or what have you, or maybe even on video on demand. But the first movies I'm going to mention are, rest assured, probably coming out in the theater near you. The first one, the probably the big one, which may or may not outseat Ant-Man and the Wasp for the number one movie of the week, will be Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. So... This movie details Count Dracula making a romantic connection while on vacation with his family and friends. And Adam Sandler returns as the voice of Count Dracula. Also, Selena Gomez returns as his daughter, whose name is Mavis. And also her husband, Johnny, who's immortal, who's played by Andy Samberg, is also in this movie as well. And also, there are other actors who were who are voice actors in the previous two movies, like Mel Brooks, Fran Drescher, Steve Buscemi, Kevin James, David Spade, Keegan-Michael Key, and the list goes on, who are also reprising their roles in this movie. And I actually am kind of surprised that Hotel Transylvania 3 didn't come out around Halloween, around early to mid-October. But then again, it is summer vacation, so it actually might work. Plus, you know... Halloween is one of those holidays where if you put up Halloween decorations in February or March, there may be some people who say, why are you putting that stuff up? It's not Halloween's over. But, you know, I I think Halloween is one of those holidays that can be transfixed into any time of the year. And if you're a big fan of Halloween, I certainly don't fault you for putting those kinds of decorations up. I, I I like all those classic Halloween characters like Dracula and Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, the blob, the list goes on. So Hotel Transylvania 3 is a movie I will see because I've seen the first hotel, two Hotel Transylvania movies, and I've loved them. They're certainly the best movies that Adam Sandler has done over the last 10 years. A lot of people say that Adam Sandler's movies have been suffering over the last decade or more and i agree with that 
But Hotel Transylvania and the other movies that go along with it are certainly the exceptions. That's a movie I will see, and I will review it for you on next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in the theater near you, definitely, is one called Skyscraper. And this one stars Dwayne Johnson and also co-stars Nev Campbell, Pablo Schreiber, and Noah Taylor, amongst other people. And Skyscraper is a movie about a father who goes to great lengths to save his family from a burning skyscraper. So it doesn't sound like a highly intelligent movie, but it has Dwayne Johnson in it, so at least it's going to be entertaining, I think. And it actually is amazing that Dwayne Johnson has done this movie at the same time as Rampage. I mean, this mo- this guy does not stop working. But, of course, if he was an overrated actor and didn't deserve to be in movies, I would tell you that. But I enjoy Dwayne Johnson because not only is he a good actor and certainly the, probably the best action star of our time, but he also looks like he's having fun in just about every movie he's in, and I respect that. So I will see Skyscraper, and I will let you know what I think when I review it for next week's show. There's another movie that's coming out. It may come out in a theater near you. It may not. I'm most likely to see it since I'm in Boston, and there are a lot of Indian people here. But I I might not see this movie. It's one called Sorma, S-O-O-R-M-A. And it is the story of the triumph of the human spirit, as most Indian films seem to be. It's about a player of what sport, I don't know, I'm assuming football or, as we know it here, soccer, who makes headlines for his miraculous comeback after facing a near-death experience through sheer determination, hard work, and unrelenting passion for the sport. Again, I'm assuming it's either soccer or rugby, but I don't know. But Sorma has nobody who's particularly well-known to the Western world, but... If it's out in theaters, I might see it, but my guess is I probably won't. But there's another movie that's coming out in limited release very quickly. This movie is called Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot. This movie stars Joaquin Phoenix, Jonah Hill, haven't seen him for a while, Rooney Mara, and Jack Black. And this is directed by Gus Van Sant, so it's a drama, not a comedy. And it's about a guy who is on the road, who, on the rocky path to sobriety after a life-changing accident, and he discovers the healing power of art, willing his injured hands into drawing hilarious, often controversial cartoons, which brings him a new lease on life. So in a lot of ways, this sounds like my left foot, but it's definitely a movie that I will see if it's coming out in the theater near me. But that just about wraps it up for Words on Film for this week. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And until next week, this is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies. Thank <laughs> you.